ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, ladies, ladies and gents, I said I wasn't going to be doing any deals because I got a lot of work to do. I got work to do. But because I have so much work to do, I want to take the time to show you something. Three people, three, three, three people in California were arrested. Can you believe this? NPR, every news channel carried this. They said, hey, these Negroes are sitting up here trying to impersonate police officers. You guys may have heard the story about the Masonic Fraternal Police Department. Wait, hold on a minute. Let's not even talk about the claims of the organization. That's important, but it's not important for this right here that you all need to understand. Okay? You need to understand something. I just watched a, well, let, let, me, let me do it this way. I'm going to replay it. Okay? That's what I'm going to do. This is that C- uh, SBS, that Christian so-called broadcast station that pretends to be new. Pay attention. Three suspects in California are accused of running a fake police department and put under arrest. One of the suspects even works for California Attorney General Kamara Harris. I'm 48 Hours Crime Siders, Michelle Sagona. The ruse began in January when the San Diego Sheriff's Office says... Hold on. The ruse. Did you hear that word right there? That's important. Pay attention to what they're saying. I promise you, you're not going to like the direction this video is heading in. Not their video, my video. My video is going in a completely different direction. I promise you, you're going to enjoy it. One moment, please. Police chiefs in Southern California began to receive letters from the Masonic Fraternal Police Department. The letter said specifically that David Henry was now the chief and he was requesting a meeting with each agency. According to a press release, Captain Roosevelt Johnson of the Santa Clarita Valley Sheriff's Office actually accepted a meeting with Henry, Tonette Hayes, and Brandon Keel. They showed up dressed in uniforms and said they were setting up shop in the area. That's right. They dressed up in uniforms. Dressed up. You know, like little children play dress up. They dressed up in uniform. Hold on. Three were arrested and now charged with impersonating a peace officer. The group claims to have jurisdiction in 33 states and in Mexico. They allegedly believe they're descendants of the Knights Templar and that their group was found. Wait, they allegedly believe? Interesting, ain't it? Hey, ladies and gentlemen, can I show you where we're going with this? Let me show you. The LA Times, uh-oh. The case against the three who ran a fake police force, fake fake, 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 fake police force collapses. Well, if it's so fake, why is the case collapsing? Let's go here, shall we? I haven't read it yet. Ooh, doggy. I was trying to look for new information on the group because I want you all to pay attention. The moment I heard the story, I understood that there was something fishy about the way they went after these three individuals. Can I explain to them why? No, I'm going to explain to them why. You just sit back and be quiet. You can't tell them where I'm going. This is my story. God, always want to interfere. Hold on. We're going to click on this story, and we're going to show y'all. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh -oh, I, 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 I'm not going to go any, I'm not going to show you anything. <laughs> Phony chief dies. Uh, the case against the three who ran the fake police force collapses. Phony chief, phony chief dies. Uh, I didn't expect it to go that way. I, like I said, I hadn't read this. I don't care for this. Oh, it doesn't like my ad blocker. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not about to. All right, I'll, I'll temporarily allow the ads. Okay, get out of here. It, it just, it don't like my ad blocker. I don't want to disable my ad blocker. My ad blocker there is for a reason. Ladies and gentlemen, I am disappointed because I don't, if he died, then that's a twist that I wasn't expecting. But even if he died, that doesn't stop the case from going on. See, this was 2016. Let's see if we can get this right here. Copy. And 
then I'll explain to you why they had a right to do exactly what they did. And there was there is no law against what they did. Okay? There is no law against what they did. Now I can't go to the LA Times. See, that's all 2015. Only one reported 2016? Look at this. 2015. All of these are 2015. Hold on. Because like I said, I didn't I don't prepare these videos. I just do them. So when, whew, that took a long time. And I do mean a long time. But it wasn't just the LA Times that was reporting it. The Santa Cruz Sentinel reported it as well, and so did so many other cases. It turns out that one of the guys died, but we also know, ladies and gentlemen, if a quote unquote defendant dies, that does not kill the case. They have the other two as conspirators. I'm going to explain to you why the case collapsed. You're not going to believe it <laughs> you, because they're not going to tell it to you in the news story. I guarantee you, let me go ahead and stop this so that we don't have another one of those ad blockers come up. Come on, stop. I say it. It don't want to stop, y'all. Stop. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, Santa Cruz police chief announces his resignation over this. Hold on. Santa Cruz police chief Andy Mills announces his resignation. Breaking news. Case collapse against Masonic police force members. Why would the case collapse? Now, of course, you know they're not going to. Uh-oh. I think I stopped it too soon. So I'm going to have to let it. Oh, there it is. I, I was about to say, I thought I was going to have to redo it. So we're going to let it catch up. Now, remember, this is from 2016. Apparently, the young man named Henry uh, says, Los Angeles. Uh-oh. I don't want to subscribe. Did I ask you about subscribing? Would you get on out of here with that bull crap? I, I'm sorry, because nobody buys news anymore. Okay? Nobody buys news anymore. And because nobody buys news anymore, they have to make their money. Now, look, I didn't click on PG&E. So, Lord have mercy. I saw it down here, but you ain't saw me clicking nowhere over here. Okay? Saw it down there. We're going to let it catch up, and then I'm going to explain about the reason why the case. Ladies and gentlemen, there are three things you need to know. First, so that everybody and their grandfather understands. They were not impersonating a police department that is registered with any of the states or counties. They were saying that they were part of the Masonic Fraternal Police Force. Anybody can create a name and an organization. Anybody can call themselves a police officer. What you cannot do is call yourself a police officer of one of the organizations that is licensed and trademarked as a policing organization for the county or state. But let's say that, I want you to follow me. Let's say that I am Walmart. Hold on. Let's say that I am Elon Musk and I want to create a security force. I can call them whatever I want to call them. That's my choice. They don't have the patent on the word police. That's the first thing. And I know that their attorney understood this. Let me explain it. Los Angeles Associated Press. This is where it comes from. The story is from the Associated Press. It isn't Los Angeles reporting this. This is the Associated Press. Now, pay attention. A bazaar. Oh, my God. It's bazaar. They do that to make you think there was something wrong with what these guys did. A bizarre case against three people accused of promoting themselves as members of a fraternal police force. That's right. Members of a fraternal police force, not the fraternal police force. By the way, all the police associations have a fraternal police organization. The fraternal order of the police. One of them is in Tennessee. Yes, I'm blocking you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, just so that you know, so that you get it, because a lot of people won't understand that. You see how this thing does? 
And I hope it don't do what it did again. Send me over there to another page. Yep, it's sending me to another page. I didn't even ask it to. Get on out of here. All right. And that's what happens. It's a newspaper, ladies and gentlemen. And newspapers need to make their money. So they're going to make it difficult on people just to read their article, which means that Sentinel won't get any credit from me from this point forward. Now, we're going to stop it so that we can stop all of that stupidity, which is why I have the ad blockers, is to prevent stupid stuff like that. Well, it doesn't seem to be working very well for you, does it, Sonny? Anyway, the website of the Masonic Fraternal Police, which claims jurisdiction in 33 states and Mexico, it doesn't claim jurisdiction. It claims that it's located in 33 states and that it has jurisdiction within its order within its fraternal police group. <sighs> they claim to be descendants of the Knights Templar. Ladies and gentlemen, who can rebut that claim? Who can rebut it? They Well, the Knights Templars were founded, doesn't matter when they were founded. Who can rebut the fact that they are saying that they are? It provides your proof that they are not. You have to rebut their presumption. They don't have to rebut yours. The criminal case unraveled when David Inc. Henry, a 47-year-old grandmaster of the organization, died of pulmonary embolism on Monday. Wait a minute. He died of a pulmonary embolism while in custody? Yeah, they're going to keep doing this stupid stuff because they don't like my ad blockers, so we got to go back again. Ladies and gentlemen, he died? of a pulmonary embolism while in custody? Well then, what does his death have to do with the case dismantling? Ladies and gentlemen, the police, remember the Supreme Court says that the police owe you no duty. They owe no duty to you. So how in the world could the police, because we keep saying police as if they have a right to do what they do. Let's go ahead. See, and now the group was created by the Knights Templars in 1100 BC. They say things like that to make you think that they were crazy. Hours after appearing in Los Angeles County Court, the Los Angeles Times reported earlier in that day, the judge dismissed the charges against Brandon Kyle, a former staffer of the California Department of Justice whom authorities said impersonated a peace officer and misused his government-issued ID. Well, why are you dismissing the charges if he did these egregious things? Another defendant still faces charges. Sheriff officials said the trio went into Santa Clarita Station last year, two of them wearing uniforms, to announce their organization was setting up in the area. Hold on now. It just raised my suspicion level. Sheriff Captain said to the newspaper at the time, investigators staged an undercover operation last April in which they recorded the group's meeting with the Santa Monica police chief. Oh, they met with Santa Monica too? Well, let's see what the group did. The group, they keep calling them the group. Uh-oh, went back too soon. They keep calling them the group. The article is in so many other places, so it's not just there. It's the fact that he goes to court and he dies. They drop the charges against one person. Now, I know why they dropped the charges against him. That's the one that worked for Kamala Harris. And because he worked for Kamala Harris and she was set to be the vice president of the United States, yes, even in 2016, they were prepping ladies and gentlemen. 2016, ain't that when Trump was elected? Yeah, sure was, and he won against Hillary Clinton. But Kamala Harris was being pruned and propped and positioned. Investigators staged this undercover operation in April to record the group meeting with the chief, Jacqueline Seabrook. Detective Amala. Hernandez testified that Kyle did much of the talking and said the group would only handle matters internal to the Masonic group. Yay! I told you! I told you! I told you! I told you! They were saying, we're going to police ourselves, is what they were saying. 
ladies and gentlemen, you all have the right to police your own affairs. That's why the case dismantled. Because somebody overheard that statement. They knew what they were doing. The Masonic maternal group knew exactly what they were doing. Okay? This thing has a mouse over uh, a thing. So let me do that now so that we don't go through all that. So because the person said that they were only going to be handling their own affairs, see, it keeps taking me to PG and E, and I didn't ask for that article. Nobody cares about that article. That must be one of those uh, current articles. So what we're going to do, we're going to go one more time. Just for this one article, you see what I'm going through? And I'm okay because that's the games the system plays. And if I have to read it to you guys from, no, you guys can go ahead and read it. You, you by all means have that power. I've got the power. Hey, hey, hey. Okay. Testified that she did most of the talking, said that the State Department, uh, also said that the State Department of Justice was well aware and supportive of the Masonic Fraternal Police Department. Do you know why? Because they are policing their own actions. Of course you're going to support that. How can you be against it? The three people were initially charged with impersonating a police officer. I guarantee you that's what it's going to say. I didn't read ahead. Misdemeanor counts of falsely representing themselves as a police officer. Henry also was charged with three felony counts of perjury. How is he perjuring himself? Prosecutors later accused them, the group, of perjury and conspiracy to commit perjury by procuring fee-exempt license plates from the Department of Motor Vehicles. Of course they can get fee-exempt license plates. That There is no law against that. Of course you can get a fee-exempt license plate. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's the problem. That's what they were running into. Anybody can create a police organization. Nobody has a dib on police organization. So let me do this for you guys. Watch this. Uh-oh, I can't do it that way. Let's see. And you know, they say bogus. There was nothing bogus about the individuals. They had an actual legitimate organization that they created. They were allowed to create such an organization. Now, I'm only showing you that because I listened to the news report because I clicked on it. I, I they, they got me with the clickbait, y'all. Uh, the, the news, it got me with the clickbait because I, I was interested. I saw the title, mm -hmm, members of this fake police department. And I didn't really care about the fake word because the fake word don't get me. But it was like they said Masonic. And you know, when they use the word Masonic, everybody and their grandmama going to be like, ooh, the Masons. What they saying about the Masons this time? What the Masons do? And so I said, okay, let me go find out about the Masons. Y'all know the Masons. Y'all know how the Masons are? Masons always getting up in somebody's stuff. Look, Alicia, would you get out of my face? I'm tired of y'all popping this up every single time. I, yeah, I'm enjoying it. And no, I don't want it. No. I said, no, not right now. Hold on. Uh, get on out of here. I mean, so, I mean, a woman. Sorry. I apologize for that, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a very stressful day. I've been Masonic Fraternal Police Department. We're going to do a keyword search. I know it's not going to be here because, ladies and gentlemen, they said they're in 33 jurisdictions. Of course there's not going to be a federal charge against them. Of course it says. I'm just going to say has been. That's all I'm going to say because they said it was too short. But of course, there's not going to be nothing against them because they can't. They're not impersonating nobody. Uh, lodge 74 is a multi-departmental local lodge that draws its members membership from police departments within the Hamilton County, Ohio. This is talking about a fraternal police department uh, that 
brings in police officers to be part of their fraternal organization. Okay? They have lodges like the Masons do. Okay? They have lodges like the Masons do. These individuals did no wrong, ladies and gentlemen. They did not violate any law. Okay? Pay attention, ladies and gentlemen. The Benevolent Association, which has been in existence for over half a century as a voluntary association of members of the uniform force of the police department. This is a separate organization from the police department. If they get to do this, everybody else gets to do it. Because they are not the police department. Their officers who are a part of this are not part of the police department when they are a part of this organization because this organization is not sanctioned by the state. So when the officers are doing this, they're doing this on their own. So all these benevolent police associations, they are not the police department, ladies and gentlemen. They never have been. The Fraternal Order of Police is not an official organization. Okay? They are, pay attention, is that the defendants is a private, nonprofit fraternal organization. The Constitution and bylaws of both the state and national organizations have a membership requirement limiting active memberships to regularly appointed or elected full-time law enforcement officers. It doesn't matter what their membership says. It's that they're a private organization. They have nothing to do with the state. The same as the other individuals. The very fact that they did that publicly was to scare the public, to keep everyone else from doing what they did. Now, there are a lot of technicalities to this. Those individuals, I am positively certain, knew what they were doing. And by them going to the police department, they weren't trying to hide it. By them going to the police department, ladies and gentlemen, they were talking to police chiefs. They were going in and talking to police chiefs. They weren't trying to hide it. And you better believe they talked to the attorney general for the state before they did it because Kamala Harris knew about these individuals. That's why the case went away, because they couldn't bring a case against them. And by the way, getting an exempt plate with the Department of Motor Vehicles is not against the law. They had the right to do that. You can apply for an exempt plate from the police department. Doesn't mean you're gonna get it, but you have the right to apply for it. It's an application, why? Because the DMV is a private organization. Hold on. The D-E-P-A-R-T-M-N-T -E of M-O-T-O-R-V-E-H-I-C-E-L-S. I put the E-L, that's wrong. I got to change that back to that. He is not P-A-R-T of the G-O-V-E-R-N-M-E-N-T. And I'm just going to put that in there. Although I already know, hey, Rod Class, what's up, homie? Um, Rod Class has already gone in the court and proved this. Now, it's not going to give me the direct answer because it can't. Okay. It's not an officer charged with the duties of enforcing criminal law in the state of New York or the Bureau of Motor Vehicles is not considered such an enforcement body. Of course they're not. <laughs> of course they're not an enforcement body. The state acts through the various agencies and entities. The Bureau of Motor Vehicles is an agency of the state. Yes, it is an agency of the state, ladies and gentlemen. So is Walmart. And so is Procter & Gamble. And so is Fibacore. Each one of those corporations are registered with the Secretary of State, and that makes them instrumentalities of the state, so they're agencies of the state. Do not let them play words with you. The state acts through various agencies and entities. In the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, is an agency of the state. Nobody ever said it wasn't an agency of the state. We just said that it is a private organization. Okay? And 
let's see is an arm of the state <laughs> uh the department of motor vehicles not the department of motor vehicles the department of education is a direct constitutional creation that's correct they are not part of the state government although the director is appointed they are private they are a quasi corporation okay but the constitutional grant of power does not include jurisdiction over any coordinate branch of government such as the dmv state board of education certain powers and duties in california constitution okay the dmv does not have no power the department of highway is an administrative department of state government yes but the dmv is not an administrative department of state government okay so the department of motor vehicle is not watch this and admin i s t r a t i v e d e p a r t m e n t did i hit the caps button again i do that all the time knew i did it let's go ahead and change it so that we don't have a problem of government and then we do that right there just showing you how the law works ladies and gentlemen it's all technicality and presumption the commissioner of motor vehicle is not an officer in charge of the duty of enforcing criminal laws they did the same stupid thing it is a state agency of legislative origin it is a state agency of legislative origin the dmv is not a state agency of legislative origin they can only oversee commercial activities commercial activities that's why you don't want to be an operator of a motor vehicle has nothing to do with driving okay <sighs> department of revenue motor vehicles division is clearly the department of agency of state government as defined in statute don't care about statute we care about the law go ahead anybody i know for a fact the department of motor vehicles is a private corporation I know that for a fact rod class has already proved it but I know it for a fact because I have their EIN number now Department of Transportation the Department of Motor Vehicles is not part of the Department of Transportation so I'm not gonna put that in what I want to do we're gonna put Q U A S I G O V E R N M E N T. Uh oh, I did that again. How did we do? How did that skip? Okay. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Come on now. I ain't got all day. I got work to do. I got work to do. Now, there's one last thing I'm going to show you guys that I'm working on right now because I told somebody I would do this, and so I got to get it done. And that's this is a forms day. I've been working on forms for the last two days. It is a lot of work. Okay. Uh, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles is clearly a state agency exercising. Well, clearly, who, who makes it clearly? Who said it was clearly? Nobody's asking whether it was an agency of the state. We are doing private corporation. Okay, it gave me all of the same cases because I put the Department of Motor Vehicles. And let's do copy. And as I copy, we're going to open up in Google, Google, Smoogle. Frugal. That's right. Frugal for a day. Oh, hey, so Frugo. Quasi government organization quasi-government organization okay uh let's see quasi-government 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 i am looking for department of motor vehicles that didn't do google books nobody cares anything about that junk uh let's see i don't think it wants to give it to me y'all Hold on, let me see if I can find it. I'll be right back. 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is not where this video was supposed to go, but this is where it's going. I want to tell you about this case. This is Strack, S-T-R-A-C-K, Strack. What's up, Strack? Versus Holcomb. Holcomb is the police officer. Strack is the individual who was driving without a license and expired license plate and all that other bull crap, okay? Now, here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to let you know because you need to know. I'll be going to the DMV. I'll be letting the DMV know, hey, what up, homie? Uh... I don't want my vehicle to be operating on your highways no more. You guys have too many rules and regulations. So I don't want to operate on your highways anymore. I will not be doing any more commerce. Okay? So I need you to take my vehicle, and I don't want to have no more permits to operate on your highways. That's right. That's right. Give me give me my non-operations permit. That, that's me telling you that I will not be operating a vehicle. Here's my affidavit. I will not be operating a vehicle on your public highways, henceforth, ignorant mother. I'm sorry. No, I didn't mean it like that. I just wanted to say that those who don't understand this are ignorant of the law. Okay. All right. Thank you. No, no, don't worry about it. Y'all have a nice day. I, oh, yeah. Whatever you say. Mm -hmm. Whatever you say. You the boss. That's right. You ain't no trustee. You the boss of somebody else. Now, you have a good day. Now, pay attention to what they said. This is the Supreme Court making these rulings, 1915. The use of the public highways by motor vehicles with its consequence, uh, consequent dangers renders the reasonableness and necessity of regulations apparent. Yeah, because we don't want you to harm anybody else. The universal practice, universal practice, universal practice is to register ownership of automobiles and license their drivers. That's a practice, but of whom? Go back and take a look at this case. We'll go, we'll take a look at the case in a minute because it's a 1915 case, so it's going to be show. Okay? Hold on, we, we'll get there in a second. States may prescribe regulations related to operation of motor vehicles on its highways. But I don't want to operate a motor vehicle. Thank you. You can regulate operations because corporations have operations. Uh, pharmaceutical companies have operations. Doctors have operations. And all of them things have to be licensed. A person who operates or permits to operate need a permit. A motor vehicle with an expired license. See, you had a permit. To, you had a permit. You had a license. Expired license plate. Commits a class C infraction. Infraction? Who are you infractionating? Anyway, his claim regarding unconstitutionality of the stop is legally frivolous. That's right, it's legally frivolous. The reason why it's legally, pay attention, the reason why it's legally frivolous is because they have statutes. You had a license plate that was expired. Ladies and gentlemen, you can have a license plate on your vehicle. You just remove the tags. No, 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 don't take that advice. Go and do the research. The tags are expired. They are expired. Okay? But if you get your vehicle listed as not operating on the public highways, who can claim that you are operating a motor vehicle? I have, specifically from the DMV, let me see if I can find it. I know it's here someplace. This is the DMV letter. No, that's a different letter. Come on now, DMV. Where you at? DMV? DMV. Where you at, homie? I can't find the DMV letter, y'all. I apologize. I know it's in here. I think this is it right here. Yeah, this is the DMV letter. Got I got to put this stuff together because I got to go talk to them idiots because they claim they sent me everything, and I knew they didn't. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me, let me go ahead and read this to y'all so that y'all get it. It says, no, that, that ain't the one. Where the one at? I got to pull up the, the more recent one, the one that they just sent me. Because they, they didn't like all my other paper my work. Ooh, yeah, I sent them a ton of stuff. And they said, here, mother, take this junk back. They didn't give me back everything I sent them. And I'm kind of pissed off at that. So I'm going to get their attention. But. They did transfer the name of the ownership because they had no choice. You know what? I don't have that paper handy, y'all. 
I thought for sure I'd have it handy where the DMV says this is not a permit to drive on the highways. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want a permit to drive on the highways. Thank you for acknowledging that I'm not asking you for a permit to drive on the highways and you're not giving me one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, thank you very much. Okay. So I can't find that document. I know it's right here. I know it's right here because that's where it usually is. It's right where it needs to be. So let's see. All right. This is not an operating permit. That's what it says. This is not an operating permit. Thank you. Woo-wee! Nobody wants an operating permit, I promise y'all. Nobody wants an operating permit. And so they're not going to get one. Okay? They are not going to get an operating permit. And it just really is that simple. Now, uh, what they're going to get is me letting them know that the automobile will not be transported for commerce on their highways. And they will get the case law to go with it. And if they really want to pay, play, I will send them a copy of the right to travel contract because I ain't got no time for the stupidity. All right. Now, that's one thing. Now, the last thing I'm going to tell y'all, because like I said, I just want to do this about the fraternal police, but y'all see where it took me, is this right here. Equitable redemption. Many of you guys have equitable redemption in your states. This is actually from a case, as you can tell. The doctrine of equitable redemption gives a mortgager, you, the opportunity to cure a default. You're in default and require a conveyance of mortgage property. In order to state a claim for equitable redemption, the plaintiff must allege that T-H-E-Y bracket. Oh, no, not that bracket, that bracket. I'm doing this document now, so I might as well do it as I'm talking to you. Has a legal or equitable interest in the property. I paid $10. Here's proof. Okay? That's that's why you pay $10, because you must show that there was consideration. Okay? V. And then we take this, and we A-R-E. And able and are willing to redeem the property in question by paying off the amount of the liens to which the property is subject. Yep, I have a right to ask for the exact amount, and you must give me that exact amount. See how I put total? Or whatever is remaining that the equity of redemption was asserted before foreclosure sale occurred. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is actually, the other one is a statutory redemption. So if there is equitable redemption in your state, there is statutory redemption. You have two redemption, okay? That's why you send them the QWR form, the equitable QWR form in our mortgage doc on our site. The plaintiff cannot, as a matter of law, bring an equitable redemption claim against any defendant in her current lawsuit, which was filed in the state court on this date because her home was sold in foreclosure sale on this date. Ah, ladies and gentlemen. So watch this. Hold on. Let me put y'all on pause while I complete this. All right, that way y'all ain't gonna take no time. Uh Uh-oh, ain't that quick. Ladies and gentlemen, I am completing the document, but I need to show you this case right here. We start. Sorry, I had to turn off the voice recognition or it was going to cause me some problems. Um, 
it says, we start by noting that the trial court did. Oh, see, I told you it was going to do that. <laughs> oh, Lord. I got to find it again. So one second. Yeah, what happens is if I don't turn the voice recognition off and I start talking like I did just now, uh, it will give me a lot of problems because it doesn't like that. And now I got to find that case again. So give me a second. It's probably, no, that's too far up. I need the we start by noting. Oh, there it is right there. Y'all see it? I didn't look at the, the name of the case. We start noting that the trial court did that the letter of credit was never called. No, that's not the one. Sorry. That's not the one. Uh, okay, this one right here. This is Trone versus Republic Mortgage, LLC. The plaintiff claims that his loan from Republic Mortgage was invalid because Republic Mortgage made the loan with credits rather than a direct cash. This argument has summarily been rejected by the courts throughout the country, and there is no reason for the court to revisit such an unfounded claim for relief. Hold on, ladies and gentlemen. Let me show you something about unfoundedness so that you guys can rebut the presumption. Be one second. Okay, I've been a busy beaver. Ladies and gentlemen, Truth in Lending Act. Did it again. Sorry, got to turn this off. Okay, as I said, I was being a busy beaver and I had my voice recognition on. Ladies and gentlemen, Truth and Lending Act sample disclosure form. Okay, Truth and Lending Act sample disclosure form. All mortgages, they must give this out. It's called the Truth and Lending Act. The reason why they must give it out because they must document that they're loaning you credit. Now, remember, I showed you just a second ago. Was it a second ago? For you guys, it was a second ago. It wasn't a second ago for me, but for you, it was. Just showed you where the courts have made it a point to tell you the following. Come on now. That this is an invalid argument that they did not loan you cash, but loaned you credit instead. And the reason why it's an invalid argument is because it's unfounded. There's no proof. Really? Mama? They say there's no proof. Sample current mortgage disclosure form. This current mortgage disclosure form tested in the study consisted with the Truth in Lending Act statement required for closed in fixed rate residential mortgages under the Truth in Lending Act and a good faith estimate of statements cost required under the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. This form is a sample form of all residential mortgages. Get on out of the way because you're getting on my nerves. Let's show you what they say. Sorry, I got to adjust my screen because it don't like me right now. It's trying to play games. Okay. Let's scroll up, shall we? Annual percentage rate. Now, it says the cost of your credit as a yearly rate. The dollar amount of the credit will cost you. The amount of credit provided to you or on your behalf. All they gave you was credit. This is not cash. Okay, that's all they delivered to you was credit. We're going to attach a copy to this letter that I'm creating, and I'm going to put the sample copy up there for you guys. 
credit life. This is the amount of credit. Credit disability. Credit life, credit disability. Ladies and gentlemen, they're not giving you. Now, you see it says credit life, credit disability. Amount of the credit. Hold on. Let's go back to the credit life. Wait a minute. What the? How come the credit premium is only $3,900? Term is 10 years. Oh, this must be one of those other. Pay attention. This must be one of those refinance pieces of junk. Because take a look. Total amount is $186,000. Total amount you pay back is this. They're giving you credit. Okay? This is their form, not mine. I didn't create this thing. I just did a search. And that's what I found. Would you would you get on out of here? And oh, you know what? I forgot about this page. It's been a while since I looked at one of these documents. You know what? Let's do this so that we can get rid of this part right here because this is this is irritating. It's only with this browser. I don't have this problem with Sprugal and its Chrome browser, but just this browser right here. So as a matter of fact, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, why am I going through it the hard way? Because that's the only way you know how to do things. Yo mama. Oh, yeah, my mama, that's a wonderful woman. No, I was going to say something else. Really? What were you going to say? Well, I can't say it on video, and I can't say it out loud because I'm not allowed to use those words. <laughs> what if you've never used words you're not allowed to use? Mm -hmm. I know you for real. Mm -hmm. When nobody else is around, look at all them words you be using. Oh, so you're going to be like that. So you're gonna wanna you're gonna wanna play that game. So you're just gonna be bringing up stuff and letting people's imagination run wild, right? Better them running wild than you, mother. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, they have a good faith estimate. Pay attention. Then you have your loan origination fee. But remember, they gave you credits. Credit report. They charge you for all of this. Okay, charge you for all of this because all of this is you. Where is it in here that they say they gave you credit? They don't have to, they just told you above. Okay, they just gave it to you above. So, this is a refinance document. So, even those of you who did refinancing, I want you to go back and look at the refinance. The refinance, they loaned you credit. Take a look at your refinance document. It was said that they gave you credit. Never gave you cash. Cash is not the same as credit. Tax credits is a different thing. Same as cash. But their credit is not the same because if they have a right to extend credit to you, you have the right to do the very same. Okay. And I am, give me one second. Insurance, credit, life insurance. Look at that. They insure the credit. That's a shame, ain't it? That they loan credit and insure the credit. So this document is up on the site. Ladies and gentlemen, let me show you. It is under the folder number eight, mortgage complaint and case law. Okay. It is under that folder directly. See, right there, Truth and Lending Act, Mortgage Disclosure Form Sample. Now, let me tell you to give me one more second while I finish the document, then I'll show you what's in the document. Then we'll put that online as well. Y'all going to love me for this. I promise y'all going to love me for this. I guarantee you, you're going to love. <laughs> Sorry. The transaction in question were not loans. California law is clear that the lender participation in a credit transaction between the buyer and the seller does not convert the transaction into a loan. 
I, I, I'm, I'm just letting y'all know, this is what I do, peoples. This is what I do. They never loaned you any money. It's not a loan. It's a credit transaction. Y'all remember that phrase, a credit transaction. Now watch what I'm going to do. Y'all go, and we're going to attach this to the document as our laws copy. And then what we're going to do, I told y'all that's how you use case text. You take that junk. I just highlight it, and you put that there, and then you hit enter. It's going to say it's too many words. I promise you it's going to say too many words. You did too many words. Don't be doing this many words. We can't handle this many words. Transaction into a loan. Let's do it again. Transaction into a loan. It says that brings us full circle. Foreigner, which teaches that the lender participated in shaping the credit transaction between the buyer and the seller does not transform a credit sale into a loan. They didn't loan you no money. I've been preaching this for years, and now we have the proof. Case after case after case. Oh, Lord. An agreement between a creditor and a debtor does not create a loan or a transaction that has the form of a loan. Ladies and gentlemen, they loaned you credit. See, there is no suggestion that the creditor is advancing the debtor money to make tuition payments. Second, the contract associated with the document does not evidence the creation of a loan. Can't lend credit, people. You can only extend credit. I, what did you what you just say? Did you just drop something on the people that they should understand? You can't lend credit, people. You can only extend credit. The banks gave you an extension of credit. You can pay them back in credit. A credit sell is not a loan or forbearance or a modification of a credit sell is also not subject to usury prescription. Ladies and gentlemen, the credit sell or time price doctrine applies. Credit sell or time price doctrine applies. When property is sold on credit as an advance over the cash payment, in these circumstances, the seller finances, blah, 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 blah. All of your refinance loans, all of your refinance loans are credit loans. Ladies and gentlemen, Go ahead and pull up your truth in lending statement. Take a look at it. If you see this section right here, and if it says that you were given credit, then yours is a credit loan. It is not a money loan. You're going to take each one of these case my laws. I'm going to attach them to this document. We're going to booyah right there. You see what I just did? Now, this is for California. You're going to find this for every state. So you're going to take out the word California. The one I'm doing is for California. So we're going to leave that there, the one for California. And then watch this. Um... Okay, now our next section, we were going to highlight, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause you for one final time, okay? I promise you, you talk about this man, this man right here, he be on it, y'all. I don't know what the he be doing, but he be on it. Ain't nobody else bringing it out like this man does. Ladies and gentlemen, just to let you know, so that you can get the understanding, this document started because I made a promise to somebody that I would respond as a result of them sending out a QWR, that I would give them a response to the company. Again, the consults do not include documents. What has happened is that individuals have been contacting me because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to accomplish what they're doing. And as I tell people, creating a document, as you saw today, 
this has been going on for two and a half hours, just this one document. Creating a document is not just a matter of snap, snip, snap, crackle, and popping and locking. And no, it ain't got nothing to do with all of that. It's a lot of work that goes into it. This document is now complete. Just so that you know, I'll give you the title. The document is called, there you go, Pilgrim. Um, equitable redemption topic of interest. Okay. Huh. I don't know what's been transferred because I didn't transfer any document. I transferred that document some time ago. But you know what? Let's do something here. Because I did make, it's a sminer, a sminer. That, that's minor, me just sitting up here. We're going to do newer source. So it's going to upload it and let me know it's complete. Proper argument, financial institutions, courts of the United States sample, TWR mortgage claim for, okay. Equitable redemption. Topic of interest. This is for you mortgage people. Okay? So let's go ahead and take care of it. Redemption. The doctrine of equitable redemption gives you, the mortgager, the right to sit up there and pay off your property. All you got to do is sit up there and say, hey, I'm going to pay this sucker off. I need you to sit up there and let me know what the finances are. Okay, everything that's owed, I want to know it. And they go, okay, we're going to go ahead and let you do that. Every last one of your deed of trust has a right for you to pay off the property. It's called an accelerated payment. When you go into default, they say, hey, you can get your property. You got to pay this right now. Well, you're doing the same thing, but you're doing it under the statute, not under the contract saying, hey, I want you to give me all the finances. Now, what you don't know is that they have to do this. They don't have a choice. If they want to demand payment, they have to give you the accounting. But they're not going to give you the accounting because they are stupid. It's all right. Because you have the right to make a request for equitable redemption, all we do is add an arbitration clause. We do a notice of changing terms of contract, add an arbitration clause. Here you go. You want to go to court? You're going to like what I did with this document. All right. Separating the collateral from the mortgage. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we changed this up a little bit. Therefore, it is the promissory note. If the promissory note is assigned, the new note holder has the right to foreclose on the property regardless of whether the note holder possesses or is assigned a deed of trust. Whether the plaintiff attempts to state a claim for separating the collateral mortgage is a claim based on the fact that the original loan is not a secured loan. For bearing, for barring, that's my word, I created it, for barring and or precluding use of the Non-Judicial Foreclosure Act in facilitating a foreclosure on an alleged defaulted loan. The original loan was not a before acquired collateral, but rather an after acquired collateral loan. And as such does not qualify as a secured loan, but rather a loan that list as collateral after acquired property. There was an attempt to defraud and or deceive the borrower. And that when the loan was applied for and received, no collateral was required. So when the loan was applied for and received, there was no requirement for collateral. The borrower, according to the documentation of the public record, received a private loan and paid a private homeowner by the name of, and you put the private homeowner's name here, and then you delete the red. It won't be in red. Put it in black. Don't put it in. Well, you can, you can put their name, get rid of the parentheses. Okay, put the name, get rid of the parentheses. Who had, it's supposed to be at, so we got to change this to at. Who at no time gave permission to place his property as collateral co-signing for the loan. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a case law at the bottom. This thing is 20 pages long, most of it case law. There is a case <laughs> law. Yeah, I, I, it always chokes me up saying that word law at the end of case because there's no such thing as case law. But there is a case law, ladies and gentlemen. 
at the bottom that shows that in order for you to use somebody else's collateral, they have to give you permission. So the deed of trust is invalid as it purports, that's right, there is an actual word, to list a transaction as a secured loan, when in fact it was an unsecured loan by law. Technically, it wasn't even a loan, statute and definition. Under the Non-Judicial Foreclosure Act, we're going to capitalize this, so I'll be uploading this again, so y'all just be patient. We're going to go here. Come on now, we're going to capitalize. Capitalize. Under the Non-Judicial Foreclosure Act, a party can only foreclose on a property utilizing such act. We're going to capitalize this. only if the loan is secured by a mortgage, i.e. collateral. In this instance, the loan was secured by my credit worthiness and was approved prior to the acquisition and or locating of any property. When the loan was issued, the funds were placed in escrow at my request prior to any rights to the collateral. It is a known fact that I, as borrower, did not have the right to pledge, to pledge, to, to pledge as collateral property that I was not, I had no actual interest. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your first footnote. A debtor may pledge security property it does not fully own, but may only pledge the rights to that property that it has. It cannot pledge rights it don't have. That's what that's saying. Okay? California, they set the standard. The debtor is limited to rights and the collateral short of full ownership are sufficient to a security interest to be attached. The baseline rule is that a security interest attaches only to whatever rights the debtor has. If you have no right, there's no security interest. Broad or limited as those rights may be. There is no bright line rule that specifies the quantum, quantity, the amount of rights in a particular piece of property that will allow a party to pledge it as collateral. Less than the full legal title will do and a secured party will get whatever rights the debtor has well, you didn't have no rights at the time you pledged it, so they don't get no rights after you. Consent of the owner of the collateral is one way to give the debtor sufficient rights in the property pledged as security. Ladies and gentlemen, did the owner give you consent? Of course not. Move on now. When you applied for the loan and they gave you the loan, you did not have any rights to that collateral, and you know it, they know it, and you didn't do anything deceptive. You were pledging rights in the collateral after you acquired the property, but however, here's the point. Pay attention. As we discussed earlier, they didn't give you a loan. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to attach the sample current disclosure statement form. You're going to attach that to this. Do not forget to do that. Matter of fact, let's do that because I did put a section in here where it tells you to attach it. So, uh-oh, this, this is it right here. Hold on. Okay, uh, disclosure form. That's the best I'm going to do right there because I'm not going to put the full title. You guys can put the full title to the disclosure form. This is for your notes. Remember, the disclosure form is in the very same folder. Okay, it's right here. Truth and Lending, Mortgage Disclosure Form. So, yeah, I'll put the T-U-T-H. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you have a truth in lending disclosure form that came with your mortgage. 
it says the same thing that you were loaned credit. Remember, I put the case law in here. If you're loaned credit, it's not a loan. <laughs> they can't lend you credit. They can lend you money, but they cannot lend you credit. A loan of credit is not a loan. I didn't say it. The court said it. Not, not my bad. Got the case law in here. Okay. What is a personal loan? Well, personal loans are types of instrument credit. You receive one-time payment of cash. Ladies and gentlemen, you guys did not receive cash. Let's change this to a different, there we go. We'll do it that way. Usually by direct deposit. There was no direct deposit into your account. That you may repay over the course of a predetermined term with interest rates. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you receive a direct deposit. That's not cash. The direct deposit is in credits. Since personal loans aren't revolving, after you repay the loan, that's it. You won't receive any more money. I want some more money, please. More money, more money, more money, mo. All right. Just like a credit card, you're required to make monthly payments, which can be fixed or variable. Ladies and gentlemen, depending on the structure of your loan, fixed or variable mortgage rates on approved credit, anyway, the average interest rate for a 24-month personal loan is 9.65, according to the Fed, Federal Reserve Bank. You can often pick the monthly payments, long-term and all this stuff, personal loans are more than just interest. Uh, originated uh, personal loans don't offer rewards, blah, blah, blah. This means that they are not cheap. That's all that is. We put that whole section up there talking about personal loans. Nessa Maseri, Nessa Maseri, the transaction in question are not loans. California law is clear that the lender participation in a credit transaction between a buyer and a seller does not convert the transaction into a loan. See the attached opinion of the courts. <laughs> For the reason that I sent to, oh, this is supposed to be you. Y-O-U, the communication regarding equitable redemption, along with the QWR, you did not opt out of the arbitration agreement, and I am grateful. I'm grateful you didn't opt out of the arbitration agreement. However, because I am a party to the agreement, have an equitable interest in the property, or having received an equitable interest in the property, or and or having assigned an equitable interest in the property, you were to supply a complete comprehensive accounting so that I could have an opportunity of repaying this credit that was extended to me in the form of a personal loan. Do you, you did not comply with the law, the law of equitable redemption, and this is an equitable redemption state. If you're not in an equitable redemption state, you have to change the word equitable redemption to statutory redemption, okay? Sorry. This is an equitable redemption state. To find out if your state is an equitable redemption state or a statutory redemption state, you have to go into Google, say, is such and such, such and such a statutory redemption state? Is such and such, such and such an equitable, equitable redemption state? Requiring, oh God. Yep, voice recognition. Uh-oh. Why? Oh, you. You to provide. the amount due on this note. I put AMM, that's a shame, for a complete payoff. The statement you provided is not a total amount due, but an estimate, which is why I specifically requested that you provide an estimate, not an estimate, but a comprehensive accounting, so as to have the note paid in full without you coming back at a later date saying that such and such was absent, missing, and or not considered at the time. And because there was a dispute of the debt, you were, to, you were further required to provide a verified statement as to the validity of the debt. You were to have received such information originally from the party whom you claim sold the loan to you. You did not 
provide any such statement verified as defined in the Truth and Lending Act. And the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And I provided you with the legal definition of for verification as well as validation, and you did not comply with the general understanding of law and appear to be in default once. Okay, please note the following. When it comes to equitable redemption, oh, I forgot about this K. Sorry, I got to get rid of the K. But whether a bill in equity will lie on behalf of the pledger, the pledger. Oh, it was a pleasure meeting you today. Without some special ground of equitable relief, but we are not concerned as the bill does not bring forward as we shall undertake to show, hold on, a special ground for equitable cognizance in connection with his prayer for redemption and therefore the bill will lie. Ladies and gentlemen, you will have to do a bill in equity to the court when it comes to going to the court and foreclosing on your equitable redemption. We'll talk about that in a split second. The power to sell a pledge security, like the power to sell a mortgage, is conferred upon the pledgee for the purpose of and sole purpose and enabling the pledgee to enforce the payment of indebtedness due to the pledger to the pledgee. Oh, it was just so pleasurable to the pledgee and the pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, basically this is what it's saying. It's saying that, pay attention, if you owe a company and they say, we want our money and you're in default and your state is an equitable redemption state, you have the right to say, hey, send me a full comprehensive accounting. But no, you want to do it differently. You want to sell your equity to someone else. And then that person says, hey, I need to get some accounting from you people. I don't believe you. This junk right here, you say this is the accounting. I need it signed. I need a verified accounting. I don't want no statement. A statement ain't signed by nobody. This is a computer generated piece of paper. This ain't no official form. That's not even on your own letterhead. What y'all doing? Send me something official, mother. Okay, that's what you're doing. And the law says they must send it to you. And if they fail to give you a complete comprehensive accounting, guess what you don't get to do? You don't get to ignore that. You have to let them know, hey, you didn't comply. You had 30 days to provide this for me. The law says, because in my state, the, the law says 30 days. So I waited 45 days. You still didn't do it. And I asked you, I told you, you sent me some junk. I told you that wouldn't do. I told you that in the first, the QWR already takes care of that. QWR that we put online for y'all. QWR, y'all know what a QWR is right here? Right here. Equitable, QWR. QWR, equitable, QWR, it's right there. Leave me alone. We put that document up there for you guys because it already covers if they don't, if they do, if they don't, if they do. Do your research on equitable redemption. I can't do it all for you, okay? I cannot be, or excuse me, it cannot be converted into an instrument of oppression or torture. See, once you guys do that and you ask for that, then they can't keep coming after you. And whenever one clothed with this power attempts to use it for the purposes of gaining some unjust or unconscionable advantages, either for himself or for another, it is a perversion of the power in the court of equity when it aids, it's properly invoked, will not hesitate to intervene and prevent such use of power. In this respect, exercise of power of sale of pledged property is no different from a similar exercise of power of sale in a mortgage. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what you need to know. The same as they have a right to sell your property to another bank, you have the right to sell your interest to another party. But pay attention. Keebler versus Jones is a primary case. Pay attention to this because you guys need to know what I'm about to say is the law. There has to be consideration. That's why you have to literally, you have to hand the person $10, okay? $10, doesn't matter what y'all do with it after that. They can give it right back to you, but don't let them give it right back to you. You can have them give it back to you as a loan, okay? But don't have them give the exact same $10 bill back to you. 
Don't want to do that because then that means that the agreement doesn't exist. So you don't want to play games like that, ladies and gentlemen. Get a person ten, let the person give you ten dollars for your equity. In the case of America Traders versus National Bank, etc., all and Henderson, Alabama, it was observed that the right of the pledger, you, to resort to the court of equity for redemption of the pledged property. It is well settled that a pleasure, the person that you gave the equitable interest to, may invoke the aid of the court of equity to redeem the property pledged and have an accounting as an incident to his right to redeem. Ladies and gentlemen, you have the right to an accounting. Not just uh, a statement, but an actual accounting of what's actually owed on the property. It took, I took and pledged my equitable interest to another, which is my right, and they gave consideration respecting that right, $10. I also took and had pledged to the organization, your organization, my interest in the collateral, known as the trust fund. So I pledged my interest in the trust fund of the United States with the coupon that's in the QWR. As one of the people of the United States of America, when a documented interest in the, okay, not when, it's supposed to be with, and my computer is giving me that, uh, what do you call it, overlay thing. So hold on one second. Like I said, I wasn't planning on doing this video. I had some work to do. This is a document day. And so that's what I was working on. All right. With a documented interest in the trust fund, I pledge a portion of my rights to the collateral, to the organization, and said, in other words, to this is your. In satisfaction of this loan, as part of our agreement, because our agreement if you would review, okay, because our agreement, if you will review the promissory note, that's a comma, highlights that I would pay in the form of a money order. The agreement was my promise to pay and not subject to your acceptance or your rejection. You never told them that you were going to pay them according to what they accepted. The obligation to a bank was paid by the pledged collateral. Now, that case says a whole lot more, but that's just us letting them know that that's what we can do. You were required by law statute to respond in good faith. Your response was not deemed in good faith because you failed to acknowledge my right of redemption. And in doing so, you are in breach of the agreement, which had a redemption clause. Because of the breach of the agreement, I do hereby declare the agreement to be void. And as such, no longer enforceable. If you disagree or suggest that the agreement is enforceable and that you are not in breach and had not defaulted on your obligation concerning the agreement, you are free to file suit. Uh, comma. Yet. Note in advance that I will counter with the information contained herein and other evidence that I have on hand. They file a lawsuit against you, you will countersue. You will always countersue. You will not ignore it. You will not avoid it. You will countersue always. And you countersue with the information contained in this document. Okay. Supposed to be what you do not have my permission to do. Is to proceed to attempt to use the Non Judicial Foreclosure Act to your advantage, as I have presented evidence to you that this is not a secured loan. My mortgage does not evidence a before acquired collateral secured loan. And because the Truth in Lending Act statement associated with the loan documents that it is, in fact, and you're going to put a copy of your Truth in Lending Act statement attached to this, 
If not, you're going to use the sample one we gave. And because the Truth and Lending Act statement associated with this loan documents that it is, in fact, not a loan, but a, an issuance of credit, it falls out of the scope of a non-judicial, out of the scope of the Non-Judicial Foreclosure Act. And I must ask now that you, and I got to get my comma. that you cease and desist with any and all threats associated thereto and will ask or will seek summary judgment in the district court. Let's say we're going to get rid of district. You can seek it in the district court or state court and demand the court enter dismissal with prejudice for barring you as a result of your invalid claims and your attempt to defraud myself and deprive me of the use of the enjoyment of my property. One more correction of the record is listing uh, my property as real estate and or real property is supposed to be listing. Uh, let's get rid of listing and um, We're gonna put referencing my property as real estate or real property. Please correct your records as soon as possible. My property is not utilized for profit or for gain. My property is defined in law as personal property, household goods, consumer goods. And the reason why it's defined in law because it's under the Bill of Rights, pay attention. Not for profit or for gain or private personal use protected by the right to property clause of the Bill of Rights. I wish to thank you for your time and consideration of this information. If you have any concerns and or disagreements with the information, you can feel free to petition the arbitrator for a hearing. The arbitration clause you receive and have not opted out of to the present day shall govern this matter henceforth and know that if you continue in your breach of the agreement between the parties, I will proceed to arbitration and seek a judgment against you for at least twice the amount of the value of the home. And trouble damages, not in addition, it's supposed to be, Let's do it this way. It makes it easier so that people won't think that you're telling them you're going to sue them for twice the value plus trouble damages. That's five times. No. Should your actions be deemed retaliatory, egregious, and or incomplete, it's supposed to be incomplete, utter disregard of law and good faith principles. You're not acting in good faith, homie. Respectfully presented on this, the whatever day of the month, put the month in here. Let's, this is not supposed to be, it's not supposed to be here. This is supposed to, this is how we do it. And we're going to get rid of the. get rid of that whole thing. Okay, this day of put month there. The aforementioned is wholly accurate, attested, ascribed, sworn, declared, and was presented on this day as such can be relied upon as it is based on firsthand information and or knowledge witnessed by and before God as such under penalties of divine retribution if otherwise. So help me God. Ladies and gentlemen, we have notaries who will notarize documents for you such as this, and they only need you to provide proof of identification, and they do it electronically. It's not a service that we're offering. They do that on their own. That's their business, and it's $10 per notary. If you'd like to take advantage of that, let me know. Let me know. Let me know. And I will forward your information to them, okay? You abuse that privilege, and you will not have the ability of communicating with them. All right, ladies and gentlemen.
you don't have to use them. You can go and use whomever you want. But anyway, that's just an offer. Have a good day, everybody. Take care of yourselves. And like I said, if you guys only knew three hours working on one document, if only you knew. Yesterday, it was seven hours working on one document. I kid you not. This junk is not easy. It has to be worded a certain way, and most of the wording in this document is 40% mine, 60% the court's. Gotta go. Y'all take care.